Thank you all for standing by and welcome to our first webinar of this fall entitled Exploring Snowfall in the United States. These webinars are an initiative of the Ohio State University Climate Change Outreach Team, a multi-departmental effort within the university led by OSU Extension, Ohio Sea Grant, Bird Polar Research Center, and six other OSU departments to help localize the climate change issue for Ohioans and Great Lakes residents. I'm Christina Dekas from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Lab, stepping in for Jill today, and joining me is Dr. Daria Kluver from Central Michigan University. Dr. Kluver holds a bachelor's degree in meteorology and a PhD in climat climatology. Her research interests include the climatology of snowfall, using statistical models to project snowfall, and the influence of large-scale atmospheric phenomena on regional climate. She has been an assistant professor of climatology at Central Michigan University since 2011. Give me just a second. I'm hearing a lot of no audios today. If you're having problems with that, if you go to communicate and then click on audio broadcast, that should reconnect you. Um, I would also suggest checking your speakers. Maybe that's part of the problem. Um, we're happy to have these great researchers here today to discuss climate change impacts on, well, on uh, snowfall. But before we get started, a few logistical issues um, just to have you be familiar with WebEx. Um, during our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, at about 12.45, I'll con conduct a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to use the chat feature located on the right-hand side of your screen, and I'll collect and pose those questions out to uh, Dr. Kluver at the end of the presentation. Um, if that chat feature isn't showing for you, there should be a gray speech bubble at the top right hand of your screen where it says chat. If you click on that, the box should pop up and that speech bubble should turn blue. Um, we have more than 200 participants on this webinar today, a great diverse group representing governmental agencies, academia, and nonprofit groups from the Great Lakes and around the country. Please keep those questions coming throughout the presentation, and we should have a great Q&A session. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey as it helps us continue to bring you good webinars. Without any further delay, I would like to introduce Dr. Daria Kluver, who will talk to us today about snowfall trends in the U.S. And you should be good to go. Great. Thank you, Christina. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank OSU for inviting me to speak on this webinar. And I'd like to thank everybody who's, who's tuned in to hear about um, snowfall. It's a topic that I love, so I hope you'll enjoy uh, listening to me talk. <laughs> Um, today I'm going to talk specifically about trends in snowfall frequency, and I'll show you a little bit about a new interface that we're working on uh, where the public can actually explore some of this snowfall data. So here's the outline for my talk today. Um, first of all, why should we be interested in snow and snow frequency? I don't think I'll have a problem convincing people from the Great Lakes region of this, but just in case, um, I'll tell you about a research project where we're doing a regionalization and then the trends in snowfall frequency that we found during that project. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, this interface that we're working on. But first, um, why should we be interested in snowfall frequency? Let me show you a few maps from this year, um, this past winter. I'm sure many of you have seen before. First of all, this is from the Midwest Regional Climate Center. And this is showing um, normal annual snowfall amounts for the Midwestern states. And you can see that it varies quite a bit, um, especially in Michigan, where I'm sitting right now. Um, it can range from uh, amounts near 100 inches just to the lee of Lake Michigan to amounts in the 30-inch per range year near the thumb of the mitten. So that's normally what we would see. And this is the map also from Midwest Regional Clated Snowfall last winter, so July 1st through July 20th, 2014. And here you can see um, a 
huge amount of snow above and beyond the normal amount uh, that we would get in this area. And it's much easier to see on this next map, and this is also from the Midwest Regional Climate Center, and this is the departure from the mean for last winter. So the greens and the blues are more snow than, than normal, and the yellows are less snow than normal. And you can see that there are several places um, in the Great Lakes region that had 50 to 60 inches more snow than normal. One more image about um, snowfall amounts. This is from the National Weather Service office in Cleveland. And these, it's sort of just a zoom in of those 2013-14 snowfall totals. And since uh, this webinar is hosted by OSU, I thought we would look at Ohio a little bit. And Toledo actually set a record for the number one snowiest year of 86.3 inches. Um, their normal snowfall amount is 37.6 inches, so quite a large difference. Several other cities on this map were in the top 10 rankings for snowiest years on record. Um, and in this area, they experienced several light and moderate snowfall events, so not really huge um, blizzards. It was sort of this accumulation of small events. And the result of this was um, that the Ohio DOT spent more than $119.8 million in labor materials and equipment to deal with um, the winter weather and the road maintenance. And the year before, it was $80 million. So this is a substantial difference in the amount of money that um, Ohio DOT had to, to pay to take care of this. So um, I'm very interested in the DOT maintenance practices and how they prepare for snowfall conditions. And um, winter road maintenance accounts for normally about 20% of state DOT's maintenance budgets. But during a year like last winter, um, DOTs and the states really have to dip into other sources of funding. So when you're driving on those roads, that have the sign that say rough road. I know there are a lot of those in Michigan. Um, the reason why they aren't fixing those roads a lot of times is because they had to spend that money um, to take care of the, the plowing the winter before. But just to, to bring this to a, sort of a scale that everybody can relate to, imagine um, the snowfall, the winter maintenance that you have to do on your own personal driveway. Okay, so let's say we have a winter where you just have one large snowfall event. Um, let's say it's, I don't like 20 inches. That's a pretty good size snowfall event. So you're going to go out and you're going to shovel, and maybe you have to spend the morning shoveling. I guess it depends on how long your driveway is. Um, let's say you spend about three hours shoveling your driveway. And you're going to put some salt down, maybe on the end of your driveway, maybe some of your sidewalk. So let's say you do a whole bag of salt. So your maintenance cost for that one large snowfall event was three hours of time plus one bag of salt. Now let's consider if you have several smaller snowfall events. So let's say we've got like 10 events, but they're only two to three inches a piece. So several smaller events. Okay, let's say you only shovel eight of those 10 days. So I have eight little shoveling guys on here. And maybe you don't, it doesn't take quite as long because there's not as much snow, so you only spend somewhere between five and eight total hours shoveling. But um, let's say you maybe, oh, I lost my now. There we go. Let's say you, um, you spread salt every time. Maybe it's a little icy. And so you're going to go through more salt, and you'd spread, uh, let's say, maybe like five bags of salt. So you can see that just for your driveway, the economic impact would be greater for having more frequent smaller events than one really large event. Now, of course, there are other impacts of a really large snowfall versus small, small snowfall, um, but that's a, a different webinar. So this is essentially why I'm interested in snow frequency. Um, I like all aspects of snowfall, but snow frequency is very important for um, the economic well-being of our states and DOTs. 
Of course, um, one snowy winter, like the awesome winter we had um, last winter, does not equal a change in climate. And if we want to understand how snow is changing, how the climate of snow is changing, we really have to look at long-term statistics that describe the climate's behavior. So that brings me to the first project that I want to share with you all. And um, the goal for this project was to create a snowfall frequency regionalization and then look at how those regions' frequency are changing through time. My collaborator on this project is Dr. Dan Leathers from the University of Delaware. And I'm sort of explaining this to a, the broad audience that we have here. The technical details of this manuscript or of this project are in a manuscript that's currently under review, and it's titled Regionalization of Snowfall Frequency Over the Contiguous United States. Okay, so first let's talk about the data that we used. Um, we used 440 United States Historical Climatology Network stations, and they were selected from, in this paper, Kunkel et al., 2009, they were selected because that paper determined they were high quality stations through time and high enough quality to look at trends, so look at how snow changes in time. In this paper in 2009, they used these stations to look at trends in snowfall amount, so how much snowfall they were getting from 1930 to 2007. And this figure is showing um, the trend in snowfall in percentages of their snowfall mean. In this figure, the filled-in circles are positive trends, so an increase in the percent of snowfall per year over time. And the open circles indicate a negative trend. Now, I want to point out just a few stations because we're going to be talking about them later. Let me get my little laser pointer here. Can you guys see that laser pointer? Oh, wait, you can't talk to me. Never mind. Um, I'm just going to assume you can see this laser pointer. So I want to point out the southeast U.S., because we'll see this later in the regionalization, that there are decreasing trends in snowfall amount. And these are um, 0.9 to 1.2% per, per year. I want to point out the Pacific Northwest, which is a very large area with decreasing snowfall amounts. Um, some of them are greater than 1.2% per year. And then another area that we're going to look at today is this northern Midwest area. And I'll show you what I found with frequency data, but I just want to point out that as far as snowfall amount, there aren't too many stations with huge trends, and it's not totally consistent. We see some increasing trends, some decreasing trends, and some that are very close to zero. So this is the data that we're using. Now on to the, the snowfall frequency study that I did. Uh, we're looking at the frequency of snowfall events, and we only used events that were greater than or equal to two inches of snowfall. And the idea is ultimately we're hoping to inform uh, winter road maintenance planners so we we guess that two inches is about the amount where some sort of action would need to be taken. So we're looking at the frequency of snowfall events that are equal or greater than two inches. And in this plot, I have color-coded the average frequency of these events. So for example, the, the light green area, kind of in the Great Plains and, and Midwest, we see areas where there's between 10 and 15 events of this size per year. Okay, and the ephemeral snow area has um, these events not very often, and then some of the largest, we have uh, 20 to 25 events in, on the western side of Michigan. And um, I, sh I should say that at this point, because I'm going to start um, comparing all of the stations, I standardized the data. So um, this means I subtract the mean value for the station 
and divide by its standard deviation. So all of the, the yearly values that I'm looking at um, are standardized where the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. Okay, so this shows the different regions that we came up with. First, we took that standardized data on the previous map and we did a principal components analysis. And we used this to identify and score the main modes of variation among the stations. And then I used the PC score time series at each station to do the clustering. So basically, I, I did clustering solely based on the, how snowfall frequency varies through time. That's what the cluster analysis used. So it didn't have latitude, it didn't have longitude, it didn't have any other information, just how snowfall frequency varies with time. So the resulting regions, we'll go through each of them. First is the southeast. And so all of these stations, snowfall frequency varied at the same time. And you can see that a lot of these resemble paths of um, storm systems, storm tracks. So this resembles where we might have a nor'easter or a gulf low sort of swing up from the gulf out to the east coast. We have the south central plains and the southwest. This was a pretty large area that all clustered together. We also have in yellow here the Ohio River Valley and the Mid-Atlantic. And you can see this yellow swath kind of resembles the spatial footprints of Colorado lows. And so likely those are bringing snowfall to all of these stations um, with the, about the same frequency. In green, we have the Pacific Northwest. And we also saw this in the Kunkel et al. paper that this region is experiencing declines in snowfall amount. And the frequency that it gets snowfall also clusters that area together. And then we have the upper Midwest. And let me zoom in on that. The upper Midwest, um, this area, which several of, uh, several of the people participating are from the upper Midwest, so we know it's really sensitive to the position of those Alberta Clipper storm tracks. And when you look in detail at the frequency of snowfall, you see that this is enough to actually split the Midwest into three separate regions. Um, and this has also been done with um, snow cover duration. So there have been some other snow studies that split up this area. So we have a southerly track, and um, a, that's this sort of medium blue. We have a middle track. Oh, here we go. That is this light blue. So the southern track would um, would maybe be when those Colorado lows are coming from the southwest, and the dark blue is our northern track. And this would would be more of those Alberta Clipper type storms coming in this way. So here are our seven regions, and I'm counting each of those three in the upper Midwest. And um, at this point, I have all of this data for each station, and I want to get a regional average. And so this is why it was really important for me to standardize the data, because you can't take the um, 100 inches of snowfall that you get in western Michigan and average that station with the 30 inches of snowfall that we get in Mount Pleasant. So that's why we standardize. And at this point, I create regional averages from the standardized data. The next step to look at the trends, um, we didn't want to use least squares linear regression because that basically just uses the conditional means. We used quantile regression. And this um, estimates those conditional quantile functions to look at how the entire distribution changes. And I'll show you pictures of these if that kind of sounded, if that didn't make much sense. Um, so we want to look at the entire distribution of the snowfall frequency, not just the mean. And I'll show you some plots. And we plotted the 10th, 25th, 50th, 75th, and 90th percentiles. And I will go through and highlight in green slopes that are statistically um, significantly different from zero. OK, so the first region is the southeast. 
And for this one, let me get out the laser pointer. On the bottom here is our 10th percentile regression line. Here's the 25th percentile, the 50th, so this is our median, the 75th, and the 90th percentile. So now I've highlighted just the 90th percentile. This is the only trend line that was statistically significantly different from zero. So we see that in the southeast, the the frequency of those extreme snowfall frequency years is declining. And on the right, I've um, created box and whisker plots because I think people um, maybe are more familiar with picturing a distribution in this way. So I used these estimates to create a box and whisker plot for 1930, and then I used these line estimates um, for 2010 to create this box and whisker plot. Just so you could sort of easier see how the distribution has changed over the period of record. Um, so you can see this, this drastic change in those 90th percentile events. So now remember from the, the Kunkel et al. paper that first used this data, in the southeast snowfall amounts are on the decline and we can see that it's also experiencing a reduction in those extreme frequency years. So they aren't having as many um, high frequency years. Now, the time series on the left with the quantile regression lines, it's the average for the whole region. And I also wanted to look at the individual stations. So I wanted to sort of put together all of the stations in that region. So on the right, I've plotted um, for each decade the distribution of all of the station data. And I plotted it as a density strip. So the areas where it's dark blue, like here, is where you have the most observations. And the gray areas are the extremes, so the highest value observation and the lowest value. Um, so you can see when we look at all of the station data that the majority of the distribution isn't changing too much except for it sort of broadens, the interquartile range broadens in the 60s here. Um, but since the, um, the 60s onward, there is this decline in the, the more extreme values. And that's really what we're seeing in the quantile regressions is this right here. Now for the South Central Plains and the Southwest, there were no statistically significant trends in the quantile regression. Also for the Ohio River Valley and the Mid-Atlantic states, so that big yellow swath um, that sort of resembled Colorado lows, there was again no statistically significant trends in the quantile regression. Now, in the Pacific Northwest, um, you can see these pretty drastic decreases. And there is statistically significant de decreasing trends in the 50th, 75th, and 90th percentiles. And then on the right, the figure on the right here, when I plot those box and whisker plots, remember it's the estimated values for 1930 and the estimated values for 2010. Um, you can see the impact, you can really visually see the, how the distribution changes because of these trends. Um, so in 1930, what would have been considered um, even a, a median snowfall event would be an extreme event in 2010. Again, for this one, I plotted all of the stations in these density strips on a decadal basis. And that's here on the right where the dark blue indicates a lot of observations and the gray would be the sort of the tail ends of the extremes. And we can see if sort of where it's blue is where we have a, kind of the interquartile range. 
you can see this narrowing of the the areas where we have a lot of observations. You see a very small area of stream events are on the decline as well. In the Midwest, for the middle track, that middle blue color, there were no statistically significant trends in the quantile regression. In the southern track of the Midwest, there were also no statistically significant trends. However, in the northern track, so this is the part that is North and South Dakota, Minnesota, and northern Wisconsin, we did see significant trends. And we saw them statistically significant trends in all quantiles. So I've highlighted all of those in green. Um, you can see there are all statistically significant increases in snowfall frequency. So on the right, we have the, those estimated values from the line used to make a box and whisker plot for 1930 and one for 2010. And you can see here that there's almost a complete shift in the distribution of snowfall frequency. Um, so a snowfall frequency that would have been a median event in 1930 here would be a very small, almost an outlier event um, in 2010. So also likewise a median event in 2010 would have been an extremely high snowfall frequency year in 1930. So we can see this huge change in what the distribution of snowfall frequency looks like in the northern part of the Midwest. And if I plot the decadal plots of all of the individual stations together, you can see where the dark blue, so where we have most of our observations, um, we can think of this like the interquartile range, you can see how it spreads throughout time. So not only do we see an increase in these different um, quantile regression lines, but they're also spreading apart where the, the higher percentiles are increasing at a greater rate. And you can see that where the interquartile range here is spreading farther apart. So we're seeing a huge change, especially in the Pacific Northwest region and the Midwest um, Northern Track region. But there are many people who are trying to plan and make decisions, um, not just at a regional level, but maybe for a particular city. So this sort of information um, may be helpful, but maybe you need something a little bit more specific. And so that brings us to um, the second project that I wanted to share with you today. This is um, a project that I'm currently working on with Dale Kaiser and Kifa Lu from ORNL's Carbon Dioxide Information Analysis Center. And we're working on a snow data interface really that's for the public. So it's um, easy to use. You'll be able to generate your own graphs. And of course, you can get the, the data. Uh, we're just trying to make it in a, an easy to use format. And this project is through the Carbon Dioxide Information Analysis Center, which is part of the Climate Change Science Institute at Oak Ridge National Lab. And this is the primary um, climate change data and information analysis center for the US DOE, and it's sponsored by the DOE's Office of Science. So I've put the website up here for you, um, cdac.ornl.gov, and there's tons of data on here. I really encourage you to go check it out. Um, if you haven't used it before, uh, you should go look at it. So for climate data, at the top bar on that home page, you would go to Data, and there's a button for Climate. So you click there, and that's where you'll find all this stuff. And first, there is um, an interface that's, that's currently up and running that's very similar to what we're working on, but for temperature. So I would encourage you to go take a look at it. This is called DayRec, and it's an interface to look at um, US stations record maximum and minimum daily temperatures. So the snow interface will be set up pretty similar to this, um, but we're going to add some additional features for snow data. 
but like I said, this is up and running, so you can go and check that out. Now, if you're in DayRec, if I go back, um, it's an interactive map. So you can select the state, um, you can see where they're located, you can get their information. If you click on Get Data to go and actually get the temperature data and what will soon become snow data, you will come to a page where you can choose your options for the different types of graphs and data and analyses that you want to do. So for the DayRec interface, um, you can do plots of the year when records were sent. So the year when there were the hottest maximum temperatures or the coldest maximum temperatures or the hottest minimum temperatures or the coldest minimum temperatures. You can also look at um, the number of records that were set per decade. You can look at record values for each day of the year, or you can just access the data. But it's more interactive. It's easier to use, especially for the layperson, because you don't have to deal with um, all of the, the data and processing that yourself. So for the Snowfall product, it is based on the USHCN, United States Historical Climatology Network data, and it has snowfall and snow depth data. Right now the data is updated to 2013. And we've done an example, uh, we started working with Colorado. Um, it's still under construction, so it's, this website is not open to the public yet. Um, we're thinking early 2015 it will, it will be ready. Um, but I wanted to show you a few images, especially from Colorado, because there's snow that we can actually look at, um, just so that you can maybe start planning to use this resource, because we're really developing it so that um, people can use it. So some examples, um, useful things, you can generate plots of snowfall per month, and you can select different time periods. And this might be useful if, if you're looking at sort of the decisions that you need to make and what time period is your data based on. What, what are you using for your averages? And you can break it down by month. We've also done trends per month. And again, you can select time periods. So for this particular station, this is Dillon, Colorado, um, the dark blue indicates statistically significant trends. And you can see that there's been a decline in several of the months' snowfall amounts. And in February and March, it's statistically significant. And in March, it's a, a larger trend than any of the other months. And then what we're currently working on, and this is one of my favorites, is calculating the probability of exceeding a particular th threshold, um, in this case, on a particular day of the year. So we were estimating that two inches would be the threshold at, at which you would have to do some sort of maintenance action. But depending on your city, that might be different. So in this case, you'll be able to select the threshold that you're interested in and the period of record, and then you can get the probability of exceeding that threshold on any of those days. So um, for this example, this is Dillon, Colorado again. You can see that in February, or early March here, that um, you have the probability of exceeding 1.5 inches of snowfall is 20 to 25 percent, a 20 to 25 percent chance on those days of exceeding 1.5 inches of snowfall. So my conclusions from these two projects that I shared with you. Um, we did a regionalization based on snowfall frequency, and it resulted in seven individual regions. And these um, sort of resemble those footprints of common storm tracks. And when we looked at the trends for these different regions, we saw that the southeast has a decreasing trend, but it's statistically significant only for those extreme frequency years. So we're having less of the extreme frequency years. The Pacific Northwest is experiencing a decline in the median, the 75th, and the 90th percentiles. So actually all of the percentiles above the 50th are declining. So not having as many average or 
larger snowfall frequency years. And in the Midwest, we're seeing just in the northern part of the Midwest that there are increases in all quantiles of the snow frequency distribution and that they're sort of spreading the higher um, percentiles are increasing at a greater rate so that interquartile range is spreading. And the entire distribution has almost totally shifted to higher snowfall frequency values. We also showed um, that having these monthly data available through the CDAC interface uh, could be very useful for planning purposes, and it will allow users to access snowfall, snow depth data, and create custom plots, um, as well as probabilities. And we really hope that the, the regional frequency information that I've shown you here, as well as the ability to sort of dig into your own you know, your own station's data and select the data that you need. We really hope that that will help in resource management and planning in the future. So with that, I would like to um, thank you for tuning into this webinar, and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much for that. Um, I. I do want to start by apologizing for the uh, sound issues that some of you guys have had. Um, I'm not quite sure what was going on with the audio broadcast, but hopefully everyone who wanted it got the phone information and will look into that for next month because that is just strange. Um, we've gotten a couple of questions. If anyone still has questions, please send them through the chat box. Um, but we'll start with... Uh, what is causing the increased frequency of snow events across the northern Midwest track? And also, have you broken down that trend by month? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a really great question. And actually, uh, we have not. We are, our plan is to look at these areas um, in depth by sort of 30-year periods. And we did do correlations with some of the larger teleconnection patterns, um, the NAO, the PDO, the PNA, the AO, and North, northern hemispheric temperatures. And oddly enough, that northern part of the Midwest did not have significant correlations with any of those. So that is an area that we're uh, going to continue to look into. Um, some of it could be a temperature um, sometimes it can be too cold to snow, and I've lived in that northern track, and I can, I can attest to that. It really can be too cold to snow. So sometimes if you're seeing a temperature change, everything else could stay the same, but that temperature change could allow you to get snow or reach that two-inch threshold when maybe you wouldn't have before. All right. Um are the um, data in this in the snowfall database adjusted for observation time changes, or does that just apply for air temperature? Oh, that's a really great great question. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure because there are um, quality control checks that are done even before it makes it to this. Um, United States Historical Climatology Network. And I would, I would guess, though, that if you're looking on the, the web interface and you're just looking at one station, it's not as big of a deal if other stations are, are checking the snow at the same time. It only becomes a big deal when you're comparing, when you're comparing stations. So I'm not sure about that, and you, you could check um, USHCN QC procedures. Okay. Um, is the daily snowfall probability in the CDIAC site updated with newer data? So is that a continuously updated website, or does it just get um, changed every few years? Mm, yeah, that's a really good question. That data. Um, would only include the newest USHCN data. So this past summer, my colleague Dale Kaiser updated it to include the 
2013 year. Okay. So it's only updated when somebody goes in and updates that USHCN data. So it's not you would not be able to get um, daily updates from that website. Okay. You'd maybe lag a year behind. Um, did you see any trends um, in the Great Lakes area specifically? Well, um, for significant trends, there's part of the Great Lakes area around um, in that northern Midwest area. So there was Minnesota and um, northern Wisconsin. So those do border some of the Great Lakes. So those areas saw increasing trends in all frequencies. I would love to have some Canadian data to actually look at the other side of the Great Lakes and um, see exactly how far that sort of northern Midwest track actually extends. And that would could help tell us quite a bit more about what's going on around all of the Great Lakes. But not on the, the eastern part. So like the area in Michigan um, was not experiencing trends in snowfall frequency. Um. With the snowfall interface, I know that you talked about um, having it be accessible to the public, and I'm fully assuming that there's research that will be going on with that data. Are mm -hmm. you thinking about taking that information, say, to businesses as well? You were talking about Colorado. I was thinking, you know, being in Colorado, would that be another application of that particular information? Um, it certainly could be. Um, it's, it is freely available to the public, so anybody who'd like to go on that website and access that data certainly can. So yeah, businesses, if you're thinking skiing and like what months would be best to hit the slopes, um, that sort of thing. Also energy companies, um, I guess I, I think more of um, you know winter road maintenance, but that's just because I like to be able to drive to work <laughs> when it's snowing. But yeah, there are tons and tons of applications, and since it's freely available, anybody could access it and use it. Um, there is one question about um, are snowfall and rainfall trends moving in the same direction, or is the precipitation coming in the form of rainfall instead of snowfall in some regions? Um, I would say yes, in some regions, absolutely. It's, it's a temperature issue. So in some cases, we're getting rain rather than snow. So think about like the Pacific Northwest. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know what the, the precip, the liquid precipitation trends are, but that's an area where um, it does not help them to get more of their precipitation as rain because they rely on the snow to sort of stick around in the snowpack and then when it melts they can use it as um, a fresh water source. So yes, the, that is an issue for some areas and it's a sticky problem because it's just temperature that's changing. Um, there were a couple of questions, I'm assuming we have people from Cleveland or Buffalo on, um, about lake effect snow patterns and the extent of, extent of ice cover on the Great Lakes and whether those are accounted for in the model and if those impact the trends that you're showing. Yeah, so um, the the lake effect areas Originally, when we were starting this work, we expected the lake effect areas to pop out as their own regions because you would think that um, you know, those areas are going to get a higher frequency of snowfall just because of lake effect, and they, they didn't show up. And in, we're planning on, in the future, looking at this regionalization over different periods of time to see if sort of the region that a station belongs to changes with time. And I suspect that um, those lake effect areas will, will show up when we sort of zoom in to a smaller time. 
as far as the um, the lake being covered in ice, um, this this last year that wasn't as big of a deal. So that the map that I did show of the snowfall amounts um, in Toledo and Cleveland was on there. That's not so much attributed to lake effect because the lake was covered um, so much longer this winter, and the predominant wind direction I think was from like the and whether they are um, representative for the regions that they're um, taking data for? Oh, that's a really good question. Let me see. I'm going to guess. Let's go back to the map. No. Nope. Did you guys like that drawing? I did that. <laughs> I know. I loved it. Well, there was no clip art that was just right. <laughs> Okay, so th this is um, the stations that we were using. They're from this Kunkel et al. paper. And yeah, the question was about where they're located and whether or not they represent the region. Um, and obviously, there are some areas like the Dakotas <laughs> that are seriously lacking um, in stations. But the thing is, you don't want to use a station um, because of where it's located if it's bad quality. So if it has a lot of missing data or if it had station moves. And so you'll have a sort of a jump in the, the station. Because of a station move, you'll get uh, spurious trends. And so it's, it's better for this, exam, for this project to not have data rather than have wrong trends and wrong data. But for a lot of the areas, so like the the Ohio River Valley is has a really good sample in the, the Central Plains and the Pacific Northwest um, uh, by the Cascades is is pretty good, but um, certainly not everywhere. So it, this is a always a problem with snow data. I would love to have snow samples. Um, you know, every Latin long degree intersection, but that's not going to happen. And especially if we want to go back to 1930 um, with high quality data, this is sort of our option. Um, now, with the uh, snow data, are you looking solely at snowfall, or are you also looking at um, the persistence of the snow, how long it stays on the ground once it has fallen? So that, um, it, with the first project, I'm only looking at snowfall frequency. So as far as I'm concerned, after it hits the ground and it gets plowed up, then I don't care. Because, <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm interested in plowing the roads. But for the, the interface, the snow um, data interface that we're working on at CDAC, we are definitely including snow cover. And this is where you would plot things like duration. How long was the snow covered? So you're, if you're interested in things like water resources from the snow, you'd want to know how long the snow was sticking around. And also changes to um, the energy budget. So having the snow cover versus um, exposed ground, you'll have really different energy budgets. So I did not do any snow cover work um, and snow duration or snow depth work. But with the snow interface, you absolutely could look into that on your own for a particular station. Okay. Um, and I guess we'll do one last question. Um, have you accounted for changes in how snowfall measuring has changed um, from a manual method prior to uh, National Weather Service implementations? Um, more estimated methods were used instead of accurate measurements. Um, well, the USHCN data should be um, quality controlled so that you said, um, you said something, sorry, there's this beeping, so it's a little hard to hear sometimes. Um, so you said something about accurate versus estimated snowfall. Um, I think they're, they're basically looking for um, some adjustment of measuring methodology between, I mean, we're looking at uh, prior to 1990s to today, 
just if there was a change, is that adjusted for? Um, that I didn't do any sort of adjustment for that, and that would be something um, to to double check because they're all USHCN stations, so they're quality controlled and they're double checked um, before they're even allowed into that first network, and then they're subset by Kunkel et al. Further, so off the top of my head, I don't know what you know any of that that other QC did for that. So sorry, I don't know, but I will look into that because that's a good question. And I think you pointed them in a good direction for finding that out from the people that run those sites, I believe. Yes, absolutely. Let me just, all right. Um, those are actually all of the questions that we received. So um, I wanted to thank you again, Dr. Kluver, for the, your willingness to talk to us today. Um, also, thank you to NOAA, the National Sea Grant College Program, and Ohio State University for funding this webinar. Um, one more time, I apologize for the sound issues. We'll definitely look into those um, before next month's webinar. Um, I did want to remind you that our survey URL is in the chat feature, so if you could take a few minutes to fill that out. Um, I also want to refer you to resources and an archive of all previous webinar presentations. Um, they are located on our changingclimate.osu.edu website, as well as our new regional site at greatlakesclimate.com. Um, we're still working with our speakers to finalize the schedule for the rest of the year, so you will receive emails um, when the actual dates for November and December are set. Um, thank you again, Dr. Kluver and everyone on the yep, webinar. You're welcome. We hope it was beneficial and hope you'll join us again in November. Um, thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Thank you, Daria. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you for having me.